you know, conformity is like when you're walking through an airport or on the street and people naturally kind of just form pathways. It's an instance where you understand the system and, you know, literally fall in line so you don't bump into people and create chaos. Society creates these orders which, in a way, limits our actions by forcing how we should behave into our head. And so then the trick becomes trying to distinguish and recognize our own free will versus external ideas that conform to the environment. So in this video, I'll cover four ways that conformity spreads to become aware of how it may influence you that aren't always as obvious as walking in a straight line. So number one is outgroup emotions. These are feelings which outcast members of a group. Think like guilt, insecurity, shame, and disgust. When there's some perceived difference about someone, we may accidentally employ these judgmental emotions to push them farther out of some group, so the in-the-group people seem closer together by comparison, kind of like an alliance through a common enemy. By smearing others, we gain favor over them, and so if we're in a situation where it feels like our social status is threatened, we validate ourselves by simply devaluing other people with shame and you know, maybe like a pinch of bullying. We force others to conform in this sort of race to the bottom of who is more disliked because we fear being demarcated from the superior in-group. Martha Nussbaum is a philosopher who's pretty cool and has researched extensively on feelings of disgust. She puts it nicely that disgust and shame are inherently hierarchical. They set up ranks and orders of human beings. And so our conformity and its cousins, institutions and government, are the basis for these rankings. It's according to who follows them and who doesn't. And the people who don't follow our rules and standards are shamed down to the bottom of the totem pole. But I believe that making a habit of doing bad things to bad people is following a road which ends at supremacy and elitism, despite potential well intentions, which I think is interesting. But number two is the inverse in-group emotions. These are the feelings that bring us closer to our own group or community, namely empathy, compassion, and sympathy. They all relate to conformity because your thoughts are being directly influenced by someone else's feelings. In psychology, this is sometimes referred to as emotional contagion, and the idea is that social dynamics, which are often unintentional, can lead to uncontrolled reactions that spread throughout a group. Now, if you're getting ahead of me here, you might be brows furrowed waiting for me to give a treatment of empathy similar to disgust, that it's bad and emotional people are reactive and conformists. No, I wasn't going to do that. There's actually this really cool study done about the effects of empathy on physicians and found empathy to be associated with clinical competence and performance, as well as better overall health for their patients. The problem then becomes the wear and tear of raw, unregulated emotion. That's the one. The study continues to say, quote, compared to the general population, stress-related disorders including burnout, depression, and substance abuse are considerably more prevalent in physicians. Emotionally charged social interactions are thought to be one of the reasons for the alarmingly high prevalence of these disorders. When we allow ourselves to take on and mirror the emotions of the people around us, a hateful, upset, or suffering group will influence us to feel the same way. And so what to do? The study suggests maintaining an emotional self-other distinction to sustain well-being. Instead of empathetically sharing their emotions and conforming your feelings, it is better to sympathetically understand and care for their emotions while maintaining boundaries to avoid compassion fatigue. It's really important to be able to step away from these intense interactions, to process your feelings, and to learn to accept your environment to become less reactive. That's even a little stoicism there to take home for you. Which brings us to number three, compelled activism. So far, in-group and out-group emotions have largely been subconscious subversions of our will but both can lead to more intentional forms of conformity. The last thing I want to cover from the study is emotion transfer, which is when we create inferences using somebody's body language or feelings, transferring the perception into an idea. If someone is uncomfortable around us, that perception may transfer to us becoming insecure, 
or when someone is angry at something, we may assume that thing is generally bad. Whenever we share stuff that is shocking, revolting, or upsetting, we are making an attempt to make others feel the same thing we do, but also so that they form a similar conclusion that we have. Biased media sources routinely make a connection to say, hey, these things are upsetting, right? So you should probably also think this stuff as a result. I like to call this weaponized compassion. We use emotion transfer to guide others from their feelings to our specific interpretation and conclusion. This is abused all the time with things like virtue signaling to make us appear better than we are. And of course, the rise of social media has made emotional contagion, which we talked about earlier, a viable way to propagate our beliefs. And so I think the way around this problem is to pay careful attention to just when that transfer occurs. Everything's fine when emotions are involved and people are sad and sympathetic. And then there's this very distinct moment which directs that emotion to some specific agenda. Remember that revolutions focus on our struggle and together we stand to enforce a group mentality, which is great to consolidate power, but it also suppresses other critical solutions. Movements always begin with a big problem and don't get it twisted. It's important to recognize and validate problems. The problem is not the problem though. It is the transfer of the problem, the suffering, the perceived emotion into one specific conclusion, creating only enough room for one big conforming final solution. Activism is powerful, but real virtue is something that is self-inspired. I mean, ideally, we would just force people to champion our beliefs, but that undermines the morality of the cause to begin with. In a non-conformist world, you would have the option to maintain neutrality without repercussion. I like the quote that there are 999 patrons of virtue to one truly virtuous person. Not everyone can put their full heart and soul into a cause, and that's okay. In fact, it's even better to have skeptical thinking so we don't overcommit to an appealing wrong idea all at once. We're always compelled to act and do, but never invited to ask why or to propose a better idea. And so I think educated and honest discussion should be favored over compelled activism. Number four is consistency. All the homies hate flip floppers and hypocrites and mistakes, but it is necessary throughout one's life to experiment and consider alternatives in our life to take risks and explore the line between right and wrong. If we're consistent in acting according to what's expected of us, the best we can do is stay the same. Someone with integrity can entertain and navigate questionable ideas without becoming indoctrinated to them. And so it does you no good to hide from alternate beliefs and opinions. The nature of conformity wants people to listen to what's right and listen all the time. But what's right right now won't be the same as what's right in the future. People perpetuate problems, but also solutions. We need to constantly generate new ideas that aren't accepted or considered right now to improve. It requires independent thinkers and believers in themselves to make positive change. In a world so dependent on social connection and factions, we are compelled to distrust our own ideas. We feel much safer quoting others and saying, me too, rather than quoting ourselves and saying, I think. Loyalty to ourselves, first and foremost, allows us to make mistakes and learn from them. Loyalty to a group just means you aren't learning, you're listening. To close, Ralph Waldo Emerson articulates this beautifully. To believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men, that is genius. Okay, thanks. Bye.